Okay, so the problem is simply the following. I'll start with a simple problem and then uh, see if we can solve it. I have a function f which belongs to L1, s comma s comma pi. Can I use some other color? Some other color? Different color. Oh, you want a different color? Yes. What color do you want? White? Okay, white color. So f belongs to L1 of s comma script s comma pi, where s is a non-empty set, script s is a sigma algebra, and pi is a probability measure. Okay? F belongs to L1 means the integral of f of x, pi dx is finite. Problem. Oh by a probability measure. Problem. Estimate lambda equal to integral of f of x pi dx over s. It's a very simple problem. And you know the solution to that problem. One of them is, of course, split the sample space into a number of sets and compute in each, val each, e, in each set a value and approximate it, blah, blah, blah. But that's not what we want to do. What would you do if you went to Indian Statistical Institute? ISI would teach you how to do, how to generate a sample and then take the average of the sample. So, one simple procedure is the following. Generate x1, x2, xn, random variables, iid, rv, distribution pi. Then for the average, f of xi, i equal to 1 to n, 1 over n, call that lambda n hat. And now we know so many laws of large numbers. One of them says that the lambda n hat converges to lambda with probability of one. Bigger? Yeah, you bet. How is that? WP1, is that okay? Is that all right? Okay, with probability of one. And then, of course, you know also that uh, if you happen to have a second moment, if this is also finite, then you know lambda n hat minus lambda times square root of n over sigma n converges in distribution to n zero one, where sigma n squared is 1 over n, summation 1 to n, f of xi quantity squared minus lambda n squared. You know the sample mean and the sample variance also goes to the right thing. But now, what shall we call this? If you're a good statistician, you would not call it IID Monte Carlo. But these days, everything is Monte Carlo. So you've got to call it IID Monte Carlo. So so MC stands for Monte Carlo, sampling procedure. Now, you can generalize that to various other MCs, Markov chain MC. What's Markov chain MC? You are given this measure pi. So all you have to do is to generate a Markov chain for which a certain ergodic theorem holds. How do I generate such a Markov chain? Well, physicists did that long ago in 1953, already did that. You know, the great metropolis, Rosenblatt, Rosenblatt, Teller and Teller. In Journal of Chemical Physics in 1953, they had a measure sitting on a finite set. And then they, they 
they wanted to compute some averages. And they said, wait a minute, we can do that using Markov chains. And that's how it started. And then it lay buried in the Chemi Journal of Chemical Physics for nearly 50 years. And statisticians rediscovered it in 1950, 1990. And then they just jumped on it and said, wait a minute, here's a method that we can all use. Except the big problem is the following. They didn't understand it. They used it for Bayesian calculations. Now, what is Bayesian calculation? You have a probability measure, and you assume that it comes from a family of probability measures. You put a probability distribution on that space, and then you do this estimation, blah, blah, blah. Except the problem is this. Many of the statisticians don't have any clue as to posterior distributions. And they, you know, they, had in the, they would input posterior distributions which are not proper. So for example, they would assume that the distribution is normal. Normal is a parameter mu, mean, and a variance sigma squared. So let's assume sigma squared is known. Mu, they will postulate that mu has a prior distribution. This is a Lebesgue measure. And for heaven's sake, Lebesgue measure is not a probability measure. The big measure on the real line is not a probability measure. So the posterior distribution is improper. This is a problem with uh, statisticians. They, they, they incorporate very beautiful methods, but they don't understand that we have to verify some conditions. So that is what is called MCMC. The first MC stands for Markov chain. The second MC for Monte Carlo. IID Monte Carlo, MCMC. Well, <clears throat> the MCMC procedure, oh, wait a minute. So here, if you have squared pi dx is known to be finite, then you know that this converges in distribution to normal, and hence, I sub n equal to lambda n. There is a, you can you get a confidence interval. I sub n is minus lambda n kind of z alpha times sigma n over square root of n. Lambda n plus z alpha times sigma n over square root of n. If you define I sub n to be this, then the, and, and z alpha is chosen according to a normal distribution. z alpha less than or equal to little z alpha is one minus alpha. So I should put z alpha here. And here I put z alpha is n zero one, and alpha is between zero and one. So if I give you a level of confidence, then you can construct a confidence interval as well. These are all well known. This is what most statisticians did long, long ago. And then in MCMC, what do you do? Instead of the IID observations, generate a Markov chain. But then for the Markov chain, you in order this to work, that the limit theorem has to hold. So the ergodic theorem has to hold. So generate a Markov chain, MCMC. But what kind of a Markov chain? It has something to do with the, the measure pi that you have you've gotten. So this must be a measure which must be related to the pi that you have, and then a certain ergodic theorem must hold. And that's not so easy to prove. So can generate a Markov chain, Xn, with invariant distribution, pi. Well, this Markov chain must be irreducible, blah, blah, blah. 
positive recurrent, what is the, whatever that means. And has an invariant measure pi. Well, that's not enough. You want to prove that summation 1 over n, summation 1 to n f of xj converges to that. That's not so easy to prove. So try to prove that. For the IID case, Kolmogorov already did it for us. If Kolmogorov didn't do that, then you can always appeal to the ergodic theorem of Birkhoff. And the ergodic theorem of Birkhoff will give it to you. You have to measure preserving transformation, and that will do the job. But then, this generating a Markov chain, irreducible and positive recurrent, you have to understand what those things mean. What does irreducibility mean? Any place, to, you can go to any other place. Well, if the state space is not finite or countable, what do you mean by irreducibility? That's a good question. That's, that's an open question. And you have to specify that carefully. And then you have to make sure that the measure is appropriately irreducible as an invariant measure, blah, 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 all of these things. So it is, nothing is free in this world. Everything has to have some control. And in the literature, they use this for posterior distributions. The only problem is that the posterior distributions have to do with the proper prior. But they use, they don't use proper priors. Most statisticians use priors which are terrible. For example, if it is normally distributed with mean mu, then mu is itself is Lebesgue measure. Lebesgue measure is not a proper measure. So how do you do that? So you have a problem with that. So there are lots of problems. And uh, this paper was rediscovered in the 80s and the early 90s by statisticians. And the original problem of uh, that uh, Metropolis, Rosenblatt, Rosenblatt, Teller and Teller, in 1953 in Journal of Chemical Physics. What is the problem that they talked about? They talked about a finite state space, finite time Markov chain. The state space was S, is a set of all configurations in, in, in a three-dimensional space consisting of S1, S2, S3, where SI can be 0 or 1, 0 or 1, 0 or 1. So 2 to the power 3. And then, if you have the number of sites available, number of sites is finite, k, let us say, then you have 2 to the power 3 times k. So it's a huge such set. Very quickly, the, the state space becomes very complicated. And uh, so now, what happens if, if the pi measure is not even finite? What will you do? So, question, what happens if pi of s is infinity? Well, this is a huge problem in itself, pi of s being infinity. And it turns out there is a family of Markov chains, which are what is called regenerative. We start all over again, and for which pi is the invariant measure. And so you can use such Markov chains, and let me at least write some theorems to that effect. So here is one theorem. Let S comma script S comma pi be a measure space with pi of S equal to infinity. 
What would be a good example of such a space that you, that you like very much? Take Lebesgue measure. I will do it. And then let f belong to L1 of s comma s comma pi. Problem. Estimate lambda equal to integral of f of x pi dx over s using a sequence of random variables. So that's a problem. And so here's a theorem. Let xn be delayed regenerative. That means I can ignore the first part, and then it starts all over again. So let xn be delayed regenerative. Or be a regenerative stochastic. What does that mean? What does a regenerative sequence mean? That which starts again and again. So for example, equal to xn, n less than t1 plus t2 plus, sorry, n greater than or equal to, t1 plus t2 plus tj minus 1 less than or equal to n less than t1 plus t2 plus tj. And then tj minus tj minus 1. Eta J gives you the history of the stochastic process all the way during the nth iteration, and then gives you the remainder of time also. And if that is the case, and yeah, then you can verify if Eta J or IID so you so you you call it. A, a regenerative sequence, if there exists such a sequence T naught, so J greater than or equal to one, is IID. So what would be a good example of a sequence of, uh, which is regenerative Markov chain? A simple symmetric random walk would do the job, for example. Or any ordinary Markov chain which is irreducible and recurrent. So if the state space is a countable state space, that will work. Or if the state space happens to be uncountably infinite, then what should you do? So there are some problems involved in it. So IID, let pi of A be equal to expectation of T1 to T2, IA of XJ, So this is sorry. Summation IA of XJ, J equal to T1 to T2 minus 1. So this is the occupation measure in one excursion. And the claim is that these occupation measures are necessarily invariant with respect to the given Rosen transition function. So RIID, let pi away be this. Then pi of dot is stationary for the Markov chain Xn. And the following ergodic theorem holds. Ergodic theorem, 1 over n, 1 over r. What should I divide by? Not n. It'll be too much. I have to divide by something less, growing less rapidly than n. So then, the ergodic theorem: one over n sub n times summation one to n f of x j. For n sub n is the number of cycles that you have generated during one excursion. Okay, that converges to integral of f d pi. 
where n sub n is what? Where n sub n is the number of excursions. N sub n, you can call it, you can define it precisely, number of excursions in 1, 2, 3, up to n. So basically, the ergodic theorem will tell you that this happens. And in fact, I can give you some uh, full theorem. Let lambda n hat be this. Then lambda n hat converges to lambda with probability of 1, integral of f d pi with probability of 1. And further, and if probability t2 minus t1 greater than x is asymptotic to x to the minus alpha times a slowly varying function L of x, as x goes to infinity, L slowly varying. You all know what the slowly varying function means? Slowly varying means L of cx over L of x goes to 1 as x goes to infinity for every c positive. Okay, so I assume that you know that an alpha. So you make this assumption that the recurrence time has a slowly varying tail, then then this this uh, result holds. Uh, Then n sub n over n to the alpha times L of n converges in distribution to V alpha, where V alpha is a random variable, where probability V alpha is positive is 1. And uh, the expected value of S times V alpha is equal to the exponential of minus S to the power alpha times gamma of the gamma function, 1 minus alpha. Alpha is between 0 and 1. Oh, so gamma of 1, 1 minus alpha is well defined. And uh, further, you have the estimate lambda n hat, the true value of lambda, and you want to know how rapidly is it dying. It's dying at a random rate, square root over n sub n divided by sigma sub n, converges to normal 0, 1. And lambda n hat minus lambda over sigma n times square root of n to the alpha over L of n converges to Q, where Q, this is complicated. Q is distributed according to, Q is like Brownian motion evaluated V alpha where B is uh, SBM. And V alpha is S in above. Namely, V alpha has this distribution. And V alpha is independent of Brownian motion with this distribution. OK. This is not easy to prove. Let's assume that you know the, you, you, that, that you, you believe that my word for it, that it, it's a provable theorem. But it's not easy to prove. But then, the proof of it depends on a very famous theorem of Paul Levy and uh, Kiyosi Ito, uh, Levy Ito decomposition. And uh, it was proved by a person called Kasahara from Japan in 1984. So, it depends on this, the proof uses Levy, Paul Levy and QZ to uh, decomposition theorem. Uh, in the C0 infinity, the space of all continuous real valued functions on zero infinity can be decomposed into uh, the sum of two processes, A strictly increasing 
and B, continuous trajectories. Every F belong to C0, 1, under this measure, P can be decomposed. into A plus B, where A is uh, strictly non-negative, increasing sample pause, and B has continuous trajectories. And this is due to Kasakara in 1984. And then I want to state one result, which has to do with simple symmetric random walk. Do you all know what the simple symmetric random walk is? Simple symmetric random walk is sitting on the integers, and you go one step to the right or one step to the left with probability one half each. Simple symmetric random walk and one dimension. And in one and two dimensions, they are recurrent. But in three dimensions, what happens? It's not even recurrent. So it's a huge jump. But then we have the following theorem available. So See if we can prove that theorem. What's the time now? OK. The theorem that x sub n be a SSRW, simple symmetric random walk, on the unit on Z1, let N sub N be the number of visits to 0 by xj, 0 to N. Let pi of i be positive, and the, let f be a function from Z to R such that f of j, f is summable with respect to pi. Then, so you have to have this hypothesis on f, f of j times pi j. Pi is arbitrary. All that we want is that pi be non-negative and then this be, this be, this hold. Then, lambda n hat, which is equal to sum of f of xj, j equal to 0 to n. Remember, f of xj is random. j equal to 0 to n, and then pi of xj divided by n sub n. That's my definition of it, lambda sub n. That converges to lambda, which is equal to, by definition, f of j, pi j over all j, with probability 1. And suppose, in addition, let f of j times pi j times square root of mod j be finite. Then, if you if have this extra hypothesis on f, then you can prove a central limit theorem also. Let me write down the central limit theorem. Then, the expected value of t1 to t2 minus 1 of f of, x, f of xj, i of xj, quantity squared is finite, 1, Two square root of n sub n times lambda n hat minus lambda divided by sigma converges in distribution to normal zero one and three. This is two. Three is the following: lambda n minus lambda does not like does not decay like square root of n. It decays like n to the power one quarter. So that's uh, a new thing, n to the power one quarter divided by sigma 
converges to Brownian motion evaluated at V of one half by V of one half, where V alpha, where V and V are independent. This corresponding studentized version also valid. The studentized version will be what? Will be the same thing as the unstudentized version, but you will replace everything by estimates from the sample. All right. So I will conclude my talk with uh, stating some results due to Kalyan Poor. He was a great mathematician. And he was a principal of, he was, he was the director of the Indian Statistical Institute. And also Herbert Robbins at Columbia University. There's a, a Robbins Kalyanpur result on Brownian motion. And let me state that result for you. It's all Brownian motion on one dimensions and two dimensions. <coughs> Why is there no result on Brownian motion on three dimensions? Because Brownian motion in three dimensions is not recurrent. As simple as that. So you already know that the simple symmetric random walk in three dimensions is not recurrent. It goes away. So Brownian motion in three dimensions is, 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 is not a very convenient thing to work with. Let me state the result of Kalyanpur and Robbins, and I will stop with that. So all that I want you to remember from this lecture is that the classical laws of large numbers for IID random variables is valid. Then it's also valid for, uh, you can relax it a little bit, but not too much. Then you're in trouble if, you're, if you relax it too much. So let me give you the results of Kalyanpur and Robbins. So let f let uh, f be l one of r v of r and m m is Lebesgue measure. So I give you a function on the real line which is Lebesgue integrable and Lebesgue measurable. Blah blah blah. And the question is now, what happens to zero to t f of b of u? du. B is Brownian motion. Brownian motion is eminently continuous. So f of b of u is very, very, very well defined. And so this quantity is well defined. Question, what is the rate at which it's going to zero? Or is it dying? Is it dying at all? And Kalyanpur and Robbins proved long ago in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States in 1952 or something like that, as early as that. So they showed the following. What do you think should be the rate at which it's going to go to some limit? Not 1 over t. 1 over t is what would happen if uh, you had ergodic theorem available. But ergodic theorem is not available. It's 1 over square root of t. Converges to in distribution to integral of f of x dx, the Lebesgue integral times a random variable z, which is normally distributed with mean zero and variance one. That's not so easy to prove. See if you can try to prove that. And then what happens if uh, f happens to be in L2? What should I divide by? So this is the result one. A, B, let F belong to L2, sorry, L1 of R2, B of R2, and M2. Look at the same quantity. Then 0 to T, F of B of U, DU. What is this going to die like? This is going to die. 
उन्हें ओवर लॉक थी दैट्स वॉट वेरी फेमस रिजल्ट ऑफ रॉबिन्स एन कल्याणपुर उन्हें ओवर लॉक थी सो इट्स डीकेंग एट द रेट ऑफ लॉक थी नॉट सो इजी टू प्रूव बट सी वी कैन प्रूव दैट एंड वी कैन नॉट प्रूव दैट गो बैक टू प्रोसीडिंग ऑफ द नेशनल अकेडमी ऑफ साइंसिस एंड यू विल फाइंड दैट आर्टिकल It's a beautiful article by Robinson Kalyanpur. This converges in distribution to into zero, minus infinity plus infinity, f of x dx times a random variable. Find out what the random variable is. I don't want to write it down. Find out what the random variable is. So that's it. That's all I have to tell you. This is a result due to Kalyanpur and Robbins. Very, by the way, this is Kalyanpur's thesis result. He went to the U.S. in the 50s and uh, was uh, hovering around Columbia University, and uh, you know, and Robbins accepted him, but then he gave him this problem, and Kalyanpur had to work on this problem. And Kalanpur solved it. Imagine how many of you can solve it. Anyway, that's it.